the prophet Zechariah has this prophetic picture of what's happening to the people of God. Joshua, the high priest, obviously a different Joshua than the one that served with Moses, is standing before the Lord, but Satan is standing there accusing him. And as the prophet looks on this scene of accusation, the Lord intervenes and says, the Lord rebuke you, Satan, the Lord rebuke you. And it says, now, Joshua was standing there with filthy garments. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but I've been told that in the Hebrew, this literally should be translated garments that are spotted with excrement, filth. And the Lord turns to his servant, who, the priest, who represents all the people, and says, take that filthy garment off of him. What is my servant doing, allowing himself to be clothed with that kind of filth? And God says to those around him, take the garment off of him. Put a clean turban on his head. Then the prophet interjects himself into this scene. The turban, I believe, signifying the renewing of the mind. As we said yesterday, condemnation is a battle in our minds. That's why Paul says in Romans 12, be transformed by the renewing of your minds. For a long time, I never thought of what needs renewing in my mind. I realized at least two major things. First, I need a new view of who God is because what I thought God was is not who he is. As I came into the kingdom of God, he starts renewing our mind. But secondly, the Holy Spirit has to renew our sense of who we are because our cultures have told us this lie that our value is based on our performance. So it's a prophetic picture, and it goes on to talk about the branch. Jesus coming as the one who finally takes all of this filth, this emotional, spiritual excrement off of us so that we could be clothed with his robe of righteousness and robe of identity as his beloved child. That's just a little extra from Zechariah. Well, I left you in shame yesterday, so we need to finish this picture off. Um, and this, these principles that we'll look at are more familiar, so we won't take as long with them. Um, instead of condemnation, I'm going to put the word conviction up here. We often use that word to refer to conviction of sin. And this is how God convicts of sin, but I'm using it in a broader sense, the way Paul says in Romans 8, I have a conviction. I am convinced, he says, nothing can separate me from the love of God. Shame is all about separation from the love of God. Instead of accusation, the Holy Spirit's ministry is of affirmation of our value, our worth, our significance to God. We said Romans 8.15 had two spirits, so this is the other spirit in Romans 18, the spirit of adoption that causes us to feel the love of God in such a deep way we cry out Abba. Twice, Paul uses this phrase, Romans 8.15, Galatians 4.6, he says, we cry out Abba. I was studying that word, it means a cry of delight, uh, not a cry of pain, uh, the, a cry of expectation of receiving more love, the way a little child might run up to their parent, mommy, daddy, mommy, daddy, crying out. We cry out, daddy. We cry out, Abba. Years ago, when I used to fly home to this tiny little airport we have in Santa Rosa, the whole airport wasn't as big as this room here. And this little passenger plane of 19 passengers would fly in there, and Mary Jo would bring the two grandchildren. And as I step off the plane, you know, no jetways or anything, just a few steps, they're standing by this chain link fence about 30 feet away. And they start crying out my name at the top of their voice, 
Grandpa, very dramatic. Grandpa, we're over here. Grandpa, did you bring us presents? You know, they're crying it out. And, and I, I even would have other passengers turn to me, Grandpa, did you bring them their presents? Yeah. And when this was happening one day, I thought about these verses. Why were they crying out my name? It's the cry that comes from a child who knows how much they are loved. This is the metaphor Paul uses to describe how we are to relate to God. We cry out, Abba. Not Abba. You know, that's what slaves do. We cry out, Abba. I used to think that God is like a father. And I realized I was wrong. God is father. He is not like a father. As soon as I say God is like a father, now I set up some comparison with fathers that failed us or even the best father still comes short of what father God is. God is father. Everything else is defined like him. Instead of doubt, God, of course, speaks truth to us. This is why we read the Bible. It's the truth serum for all this poisonous thinking. I think some people suffer from shame and condemnation because they neglect the word of God. It's that simple. The enemy daily bombards us with this lie from our cultures, from our backgrounds, from our memory. You're not good enough. You're never enough. You're too much this. You're not. The word of God is the antidote. As I read it daily, it reminds me who God is, who I am. I began to memorize scriptures that told me who I am in God. So that when the condemner came with that lie, again, you never do anything right. Who are you to think God called you to do this? I had the word to use as a weapon the way Jesus used the word as a weapon against it. Satan, I resist you in the name of Jesus. The scriptures say I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And on and on, filling ourselves with the word of God becomes a powerful weapon against this attack on our minds. Um, I, I, I began to keep a journal. Somebody gave me this suggestion. I'm, I'm not a journal person. It's never, never quite got the hang of it. I used to keep a journal and I'd go back and look at it and think, man, I was really bummed out that day, and I was sure depressed that day, and I thought, I don't know why I'm writing all this. I'm not against journals, it's just I never quite figured it out for me. But they, they said, keep a journal in which you ask God just one thing, God, how do you see me today? Well, I'd never done that. When you live in shame, you're afraid to ask that question, of course. And uh, so I, I remember the first day I bought a new journal, went before the Lord in prayer, submitted my thoughts to him. I said, okay, God, I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to trust that the thoughts that come to me are from you. Here I go to God. How do you see me today? Thoughts are flooding my mind. I'm writing as fast as I can. After a couple of minutes, I stop and look at what I, w I had written. I could feel that my neck was hot, red with embarrassment. God thinks I'm this wonderful. I... I thought, no, I better make sure no one ever sees this journal, you know. <laughs> I think I'm biggest ego around here. And then the doubt came, that's not Father God speaking those thoughts to you. That's just you wishing God would say that about you. But when I would read the words the next day, they would be life to me. The next time they would be life. I've, I've been doing it now for 30 years. Not every day, but perhaps every few weeks, every single time it's come with positive affirmation to my spirit of how my heavenly father sees me. Even times where God's been convicting me of sin and showing me where I was wrong, it comes in a way. But my whole point is when I first started doing that, that was like hearing a foreign language in my head. All I'd heard was you don't, you can't, you're never, you're always, and God was saying you are, you can, you will, you do. And between that journal and the word of God, that started a healing process in my mind from shame and condemnation. When God speaks, it's never vague. It's always specific. If you ask God, is there any sin in my life? Get ready. <laughs> he will be so specific. He will not say, yeah, you've got so much, I don't even know where to start with you. No, he will bring back. Do you remember that conversation you had at lunch today? You gossip. 
Oh, God, I see. I'm sorry, God. I'll, I'll make that right. See, God's very specific. He doesn't play these games that sometimes we can play with each other. We're mad at somebody, but we won't tell them why we're mad at them because we want to make them suffer a little bit because they made us suffer. No, God's very specific, but very positive. Even if he's convicting us of sin, it's very positive. We, it comes in a way that makes us feel loved by God. Just as a wise parent knows how to discipline their child in a way that makes the child still feel secure in that parent's love. Of course, God, the wisest of any parent. Um, secondly, instead of confusion, obviously, God loves to give clarity to us. This is the way. Walk this way. He loves to give. He is not offended if we ask him a second time, is this really what you want me to do, God? He loves to give clarity. He recognizes we're children, learning to hear his voice. He's patient to speak to us. And, and when God speaks something to us, it's very simple. When we start to think my life is some complicated mess or this problem is some complicated solution out there somewhere, I, I think that's a smoke screen. God's ways are always simple. This is the path. Walk this path. This is the next step. Our problem is we want to see the next 100 steps. God just says, no, take this next step. But God, no, just take this next step. There's simplicity. It's a shepherd leading his people. It's not a slave master driving his people. Um, one of the enemy's favorite lies that he uses against God's people, he tries to tell God's children that you cannot hear the voice of God. Have you ever heard that lie from Satan? Um, I think sometimes we make hearing God's voice too complicated. There's many ways God speaks. I'm probably going to get on thin ice here, so here I go out on my thin ice. There's many ways God speaks, of course, through his word, through circumstances, through his body, through leaders. But I think we often overlook the most simple way he speaks. He speaks through our heart desires. Psalm 37, 4, he will give you the desires of your heart. Psalm 145, 19, he will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. Romans 12, 2, the will of God is something pleasing to us, not fearful to us. Uh, I used to think it was just the opposite. I used to think if it's my desire, then it could not possibly be the will of God. And I even had a scripture verse, my ways aren't your ways, my thoughts aren't your thoughts. And I was doing that little number one day, and God says, no, you're quoting that verse out of context. Uh, who gave us this capacity to have dreams and desires? Did not the Creator put that in us? So when we get, become Christians, does he rip it all out of us? And we just become robots? You just tell me where to go, God, and what to do? I have no feelings of my own? No, he works through our passions, our desires. I believe many times God puts dreams and desires in our hearts when we're young children like these children we had here. I believe God does that. But we grow up, and I don't know what happens. You know, theology beats it out of us, or, or somebody tells us it's selfish to have your own desires, you know, and we just, we, we think that it's all got to come from something totally outside of anything I've ever thought of. Sometimes God does that, of course. But many times he works through our heart desires. Uh, I... I think the will of God ought to be too good to be true. It ought to make us go, yes, God. Wow, God. God, if I could do anything, yes, that's what I want. Um, I would challenge you. Offer to God the deepest desire in your heart right now. God, if I could do anything or have anything, here's what I want the most. And then I pray, God, if this isn't your desire, if this is selfish of me, please take this desire away. I don't want something that's wrong. But God, if you put this desire in me, then God, confirm it. Let it grow. God will answer that prayer. God's not going to let you have a desire that's wrong and the whole time you're asking him to take it away and then you're going to be disciplined for disobedience. What kind of God would do that? What kind of father would do that? If the son came to the father or the daughter and said, Dad, am I doing anything wrong that's displeasing you? And, or Dad, here's what I want to do and the parent knows it's wrong, but... No, God will show us if it's wrong. We'll say, thank you, Lord. Wow. If it's right, it will grow. It will intensify. 
Uh, you can try to kill it. You can try to die to it. You can try to shove it aside, and it won't get killed. It'll just keep popping back up inside of you. But it will always seem scary because the dreams God puts in us are far beyond our ability to accomplish in ourselves. And we'll think, this doesn't make sense. I'm not qualified. I don't know the right people. I don't have the money. But this just doesn't go away. At some point, we have to trust our Father's not playing games with us. That he put that desire so we can take that first step and watch what happens. To me, that's simple. It's not a complicated process. Thirdly, instead of fear, God gives us confidence. When God heals our shame, our condemnation, wow, watch out. You're, you're gonna, we're we're going to start shocking ourselves with the confidence and the boldness we feel. And, and it's going to happen out in the middle of something we're doing, and all of a sudden we're just going to kind of shake ourselves to some reality. Or, what in the world am I doing out here? This is my biggest fear. I'd ever have to do something like this or take a step like this. Where is this confidence coming from? Because God has removed our fear of failure. God has removed this lie that I'm only loved if I'm perfect so I can take a risk that I could fail. This is one of the practical applications for all of this for us here. You know, it's hard to be risk takers for God when we live in shame and condemnation because the shame lie says my, my lovability depends on how successful my performance is. But once that's out of our minds, Wow, God, we'll find limits removed on what we can do for God that we never imagined was possible when we lived in shame and condemnation. Confidence that my God loves me, confidence to open up to others as we, we listed some of the areas of fear there, uh, that even if they see my failures, my shortcomings, that's okay. I can handle like uh, Hugo said, Brother Hugo, if you don't like me, that's okay. I still like you. You know, we can, I can handle confidence to risk failure. Confidence of God's love if we have failed. Um, one of the scriptures in, in Hebrew says, be bold, have confidence to come to the Lord in your time of need. The throne of grace, right? Well, it's one of our biggest times of need is when we have sinned or failed. When do we least feel bold to come to God? Yeah. Why? We, we still don't understand his love. He says, especially in that time of need, when you feel, be bold, have confidence to come to the throne of grace. Understand that my love does not reject you when your performance level does not measure up to your own standards. You know, we, we put that graph up there yesterday of, of how we... We grow up thinking we have to measure up to the standards that the authority figure sets for us in order for them to love us. By the time we're adults, or even before we get to that age, we don't need anybody else to shame us. We shame ourselves. We just have our own internal standards of, of what we are requiring of ourselves in order to feel like we're a person of value. Voice of God in this stage, he's a shepherd leading us. God, gentle with us. This way, my son. This way, my daughter. No, 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 that leads to destruction. This way, there's a gentleness in God leading us. He's not a harsh father, slave driver, beating on his children. Uh, the Holy Spirit is pictured as uh, what kind of a bird? A dove? A dove, a uh, very gentle bird, kind of fluttering over God's people. Coo, coo, cooing over God's people. Holy Spirit isn't a hawk dive bombing us. You know, it's like there's, there's reasons that these pictures are, uh, God picks these symbols to, to accurately describe his character. Fourthly, instead of despair, God gives hope. few things more desperately needed in our day and age today than hope. 
I guarantee you from wherever you came to this place, right next door to where you live or within a few doors, people live in utter hopelessness for their lives, their families, their health, their, their finances. We have the answer. Christ in us is our hope. But we can't give it away if it's not real to us. Uh, hope comes from uh, keeping our focus on God. Despair comes from too much focus on self. I think even the healthiest of us psychologically can get in despair if we look at ourselves too much. I, I saw this book in a Christian bookstore a while back. I didn't buy it, but the title intrigued me. Uh, it, it was uh, big bold letters, Leave Yourself Alone was the title. And the subtitle was The Paralysis of Self-Analysis. And I thought, okay, there, there's some truth there. There's a time, of course, to look at ourselves. But then there's a time to just look at God. That's why worship, worship is powerful to heal our shame. When God first started healing my shame, I would often find myself just weeping in a worship time. And I, I didn't understand why. And I realized after a while, it was just... It wasn't so much I was loving God, it was just I was receiving his love. Because when you live in shame, as we talked about yesterday, you can't receive love because your shame says, no, you wouldn't be doing this if you really knew what I was like. And we're able to receive love. And worship sometimes just bypasses the intellect, goes spirit to spirit. And I think some of the healing, uh, even this weekend, comes as we worship, as we worship. And we, we sense the presence and the love of God touching our hearts. That's hope for whatever we're dealing with. The last stage. Well, instead of striving, I better finish this. God teaches us to rest. I'm going to put the word wait up here too. It's a beautiful scene to see a man or woman who are at rest in who they are in God. When you find a person like that, don't you just want to kind of sit at their well for about three days and just <laughs> drink deeply of that rest? No posturing, no uh, fig leaves, no mass trying to prove how spiritual or successful. Just at rest in their own identity. The way the beloved Apostle John was at rest, calls himself the disciple Jesus loves. That's his identity. That used to bother me. I used to think, John, why do you think Jesus loved you more than the other disciples? And I realized one day he didn't say the disciple Jesus loves the most. He just says the disciple Jesus loves. That was his identity. I'm the son. I'm the daughter. My heavenly father loves. That's rest. And I put the word wait up here too because... Waiting is part of God's training of his servants. Takes us into the school of waiting. You will never be able to wait if you doubt God's love for you. You will never be able to wait if you doubt God's love for you. Waiting is staking your whole life on your conviction. God loves me. He knows what's best for me. When we're waiting, everything's out of control. And it brings to the surface all of our compulsions to have to be in control of everything. Because nothing works when we're waiting. We try, we try, we try. Nothing ends a waiting season. And God just says, will you relax here? Will you just rest? Um, I don't know if you noticed that I put up words here that describe feelings. Uh, so that we can recognize what, when the voice of condemnation is raising up its head against us. Uh, well, when I was raised in church, I was told feelings have nothing to do with the Christian life. It's kind of interesting because I was raised in a Pentecostal church, so go figure, you know. It's like, <laughs> but, and then I, and then I thought about one day, well, if feelings have nothing to do with the Christian life, then why did God give us feelings? We don't govern our life by our feelings. We govern our life by our choices. But feelings are significant. Feelings are a window into our soul. Feelings are a window into a belief system. Behind each feeling is something that I'm believing. So the enemy, you know, he just doesn't walk into our lives. Hi, here I am. I'm going to condemn you today. Let's go for it. Oh, no. He couches it, hides it, uses our past failures, our 
Achilles heel in our armor, whatever. But this can help expose it. We can look at ourselves and say, wait a minute, why am I feeling so doubtful? Why am I feeling so confused and struggling with fear here? And where's this hopelessness coming from and this feeling of isolation and who cares? Those aren't feelings the Holy Spirit produces, where's that? Oh, of course, it's that condemner again. Satan in Jesus' name, I rebuke your lies. Leave me alone. The scripture says, resist the devil. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. We're giving us some practical principles here of how we fight for our own love relationship with God. You know, it's, I wish there was some magic wand. We just kind of sprinkle some God fairy dust on everybody and, and, all, and all the condemnation and shame heals. You know, condemnation and shame came to us line upon line word by word, starting when we were very young. And God renews us line upon line, scripture after scripture every day, uh, relationship after relationship, battle after battle with the enemy. The power of shame was broken on the cross, and I believe it's broken the day we give our lives to God. But then the Holy Spirit starts retraining our thought processes here. Uh, so we, that's why the Bible says, think on these things. These are the things that show us we're thinking the wrong things. These feelings can help expose that. The final stage is intimacy. Just to remind us, we're talking about love here. As we saw yesterday, the biblical metaphor for intimacy is nakedness. They were naked and not ashamed. No fig leaves, no walls, no covers. Ultimately, God heals our shame through the body of Christ. For a long time, I didn't understand that. I thought it was just between me and God. And I was praying one day about a uh, problem I had in my life. It was an attitude problem. And then I'd keep it under control sometimes, but you put me in the right set of circumstances, and that attitude would come up, and it was not nice. And I'd ask God several times, would you heal this in me? And, and one day I was just kind of upset with God. God, why don't you ever do this? And I felt the Lord say, I, I can't do that for you. I said, God, you can do anything. He says, no, Joe, I can't do it for you because you do not love my body. I said, God, that is not true. I suggest you don't say that to God. But, you know. <laughs> I said, God, I love your body. I, I've got the scars to show for it when I put up with your body. God says, no, you don't think you need my body to be spiritually whole. I says, no, God, I don't. Just you. Just, I don't need man or woman or flesh and blood. I just need you. God says, no, that's not how it works. God said, this isn't man and woman, flesh and blood around you. This is my body. My life is in these people. I felt God say, yes, I could heal you, just you and me, but I won't do it that way because then you will never have a debt of love to my body. I'd been a pastor at that point 20 years. I had not understood that. So I said, God, what do I do? He said, two people in your church have testified to you how I've healed them in this very same area of your life. Go to them, ask them to teach you what I've taught them and pray for you and I will heal you. I said, God, I'm their pastor. <laughs> God said, so? <laughs> I said, well, God, it's two women. You know, maybe people think something's funny. God said, well, take your wife. So I went to these two sisters. They were dear leaders in our church. I said, remember when you were telling me how God was helping you in this area? I said, by the way, is it still working? You know, I want to make sure it was still working. <laughs> oh, yeah, you know, God's done all these things. And I says, well... I was too proud to confess earlier, I have the same need. I think they had already figured that out. <laughs> I told them what God had told me, and I could see them kind of shrink back. I said, no, I don't come to you with my role in the church. I come to you as another brother who needs the bread God's given you. Would you teach me and pray for me? I thought it would take like 15 minutes. They had this whole notebook of teachings to get to the root of this issue, so we met for a number of weeks. They taught me, they prayed for me, and God healed me. 
to teach me that we don't learn the love of God in isolation from one another. See, how did we get shame? Where did it come from? Uh, multiple choice here. Where did shame come from? Did it come from horses, trees, or people? Yeah. So how does God heal us? He uses people. We got shame from people. We don't blame them. We're not bitter against them. Shame from people who could not give us all the love we needed. No one can give you all the love you need. So how does God heal us? He uses people who can give us the love we need, his love. The body of Christ is powerful to heal our shame. We've heard a lot of talk this weekend about community and intimacy. Well, this is what it means. It doesn't just mean singing together and eating together, and that's all nice, and <laughs> ministering together, that's all nice, but it means letting people see the naked person I am, spiritually and psychologically and emotionally. Letting them see me without all the fig leaves. Because then, when we're loved, and someone knows all our faults, all our brokenness, and they still love us, that's healing for our soul. That is the final blow to the chains of shame that have gripped us, because shame is powered by the fear that if people find out I'm this way, that they will reject once I know they know and they still love me wow isn't that the way the love of God is the joy that comes from knowing somebody loves you no greater joy in life than knowing someone delights in you no greater joy in life I've been part of many denominations over the years, uh, the whole spectrum. Uh, so I'm very confused theologically. Uh, <laughs> but it was only a few years ago that I connected with some Presbyterians. And the first time I was asked to preach at a Presbyterian church, I was a little nervous because I wasn't sure I knew all their doctrines. I didn't want to offend anybody. There's plenty of stuff we could talk about that we're in agreement with. And so I, I happened to mention this to the pastor. He said, oh, he says, go get the Westminster Confession of Faith. He says, that's what Presbyterians believe. So I went and got it, and it's this statement of faith. You, many of you know what it is. We believe in God the Father and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And then at the end of it, there's some questions you teach the new convert called catechism. And the new convert is supposed to mem memorize the answer. First question in the Westminster Catechism, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. I read that. I thought, wow, Presbyterians are smart. <laughs> enjoy God forever. I found the Methodists believe this, and they probably the Anglicans do. I, know. I, th I can preach about enjoying God forever. So my first Sunday in the church, going with my Bible, Westminster Confession, try to show them I'm a good Presbyterian. And uh, I said, first, I, I want to speak on the Westminster Confession, but first I want to ask everybody a question. How many enjoyed God this week? They all look at me. Like... <laughs> I said, please, uh, raise your hand. How many enjoyed God this week? What do you mean? I said, uh, we're Presbyterian. It says right here, we enjoy God. One of the elders says, it does say that? I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, it does. <laughs> This was a beautiful congregation. They really did love God. And so we talked that morning. Why do we not enjoy God? I didn't really know what the answer was. They came up with the answer. They said, the reason we don't enjoy God is we still don't know how much God enjoys us. I thought, bingo. Yes. When you think somebody doesn't enjoy you, do you want to hang out with that person? Of course not. But when you know somebody delights in you, you can't spend enough time with them. One of the things that happens when God heals our shame, we're going to be like Brother Hugo, so full of joy, we just don't know what to do with it all. You know, it's like, you know, people that live in shame don't like to have fun. They feel guilty about having fun. They feel it's a waste of time. Uh, when Mary Jo and I got, first got married, I told her there's only one thing I don't ever want you to do in our marriage. 
please do not ever have a surprise birthday party for me. I said, I will not enjoy it. You will waste all your time and money. So she never did. A few years ago, I'm reading this book about shame, and I said to Mary Jo, listen to this. This book says that people who live in shame don't like to have a party. I, <laughs> I, I said, do you think this applies to me? She goes, duh. <laughs> I said, oh, is that why I never wanted one? Wow. So I guess she had figured God had done a good deal of healing my shame. And so that next year I had my first surprise birthday party. She invited 50 Christian friends and 50 of our non-Christian pub friends that we've been sitting in the pub with for 10 years, building relationships with. And it was so much fun. After three hours, the Christian friends left. The pub friends stayed another seven hours, you know, <laughs> celebrating Pop's birthday, you know. And I, at the end of it, I thought, wow, God, thank you for healing my shame. I could, I could let people celebrate with me without protesting. Oh, you shouldn't. Or, no, that's not true. Or feeling embarrassed. You shouldn't have gone to this trouble. We celebrate one another. There's joy. When God heals our shame, it, it, everything changes. Well, my time's gone. Intimacy. I was listening to Brother Peter and Hugo talk this morning about the wounds we have from God, at least as we perceive it. The day before I came here, flew here, Mary Jo and I went to the hospital to see one of my closest friends. Neil is his name. Vibrant businessman. Found out a few weeks ago he had brain cancer. His whole world, of course, changed. He had the surgery. They got 95% of it out, but the 5% left, they said, was stage four cancer. And they said there's zero percentage of recovery chance. It's just a matter of how much time you have. And, and we didn't recognize him. It had been, he'd been in the hospital for a couple weeks when we saw him. This man says he had been taken into the presence of God the last two weeks like he had longed his whole life for. Intimacy with God. And he's just, he couldn't talk about it without weeping. And he says, Joe, do you know what the final barrier of intimacy is? I said, I probably don't know. What is it? He said, the final barrier is letting God into the place in your heart where God hurt you or where you think God hurt you. That place you've had where you were still upset because God didn't answer this prayer and he let this happen and he allowed me to be hurt by this and, and this person died, whatever it was. He said, I was able to let God into that place. He'd been mad for years, his own testimony. Churches and leaders and betrayal and whatever else. Failed dreams. He said, I let God into that place of intimacy. And he says, I have no more issues of God. God I'm not offended by God anymore. And you could see it all over. And, I, and we left the hospital and I said to Mary Jo, I don't want to go through what my friend Neil has gone through but I want what he has just discovered. That intimacy with God that there's no place of offense left. I'm his son. He loves me. Come what may, nothing will ever change that. Satan will try, but God has promised no more condemnation. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you.